Well, good morning, and uh, we're getting continuing in our series in classic Old Testament passages. If you have the app, you can look at the outline and also the questions there as well, and also it's on our website and was emailed to everybody in the church, and kind of the format we're going to be using in our small groups. But this morning, I want to look at a subject matter that everybody, under the sound of my voice, struggles with. We all deal with the subject matter, and don't miss this. God, why am I here right now? I don't want to be here. This is not the place that I feel I should, where you want me, and why is it I am here? Well, the nation of Israel felt the same way. No doubt about that. And we find in our text this morning, four times the word is either directly states or indirectly, God led them. Now I want to tell you, we got the God that spoke the universe into existence. The God that saved your wicked soul. And if God has led you there, don't miss this, then God has a reason for you being there. And He will bless you in spite of the circumstances that surround you. This text is the precursor for the crossing of the Red Sea. And you... Sometimes we get to the point, we like to look at the crossing of the Red Sea, that Moses led the, the nation of Israel across the Red Sea, over to the Sinai Peninsula, and the water came crashing down upon the Egyptians. But yet, leading up to that point, it was kind of difficult to look back and see the entire Egyptian army, or 600 chariots, coming at you, You're stuck, you can't go to the left, you can't go to the right, and the only way forward is the Red Sea. And you're saying to yourself, God, why did you put me here? I want to preach a message that's simply titled this morning, Trusting God's Leading. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, no doubt, for the people that are here, for those that are watching and listening, I know many are wondering, why is it I am here? Lord, I pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit, that you would guide and direct my words. And Lord, that for those here that need Christ as their Savior, let this be the message of God's leading. And for others, Lord, help us to seek your will and your way for our lives in spite of the surroundings and the circumstances that we have. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, God, God's ways are not our ways. And God has a way of leading us sometimes to places that we never ever would be expect that we should be there. In fact, we even sanct- sanctify it sometimes and say, God, surely you wouldn't have me here. And we find that that's what's taking place here. See, Moses left the backside of the desert, as we discussed. He left his father-in-law, Jephro. He goes back to Egypt to to go to Pharaoh, and I believe he thinks, he actually thinks this. He thinks, I'm just going to go to Pharaoh and say, hey, let my people go, and it's a done deal, and everything, as they say down south, is hunky-dory. But I'm going to tell you, it didn't work that way. It didn't work that way at all. In fact, it got really kind of bad. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, God will give us direction, we'll seek it in His Word, we'll pray about it, we'll do exactly what God wants us to do, and it doesn't work out. Welcome to Moses' life. Exodus chapter 5, it's interesting, you have your Bibles with you, I think I have it on the screen, gives the first indication it's not going to work out the way that Moses wanted. Here's his first presentation to Pharaoh. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh. Now they're thinking their chests are probably puffed up a little bit, you know. This is the calling. We're just going to speak it, and guess what's going to happen? He's going to say, oh, okay, no problem. There's 600,000 of you guys here, not counting women and children. It's my only labor force that I have on the Nile River in the, in the area of the, the Fertile Crescent there. It's the only area I got, so I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll just let you go, no problem. 
He didn't say that, did he? Pharaoh said, thus say, they said, thus say the Lord God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Can I say he could care less about that? Just like our culture could care less about how we worship, if we worship, even if we're allowed to worship, stop complaining about it. Because that's who they are. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Can I say this in modern day vernacular? Are you kidding me? Not going to happen. I know not the Lord neither will let Israel go. That is the beginning, ladies and gentlemen, we won't go through this, of ten plagues that would be inflicted on Egypt. It was a result of Pharaoh's heart and heart, God would afflict ten plagues on, Egypt, plagues on Egypt. He would show the Egyptians that their gods are nothing. Now, I looked, I did a little study on this, uh, how long did it take these ten plagues, and there's not a consensus on it, but most people, at least that have studied this, that look at the languages, the culture, and the history, believe that the ten plagues lasted somewhere, it wasn't over a very long period of time, could be as short as 12 weeks, could be as long as six months to a year. It's estimated that a seven to 12 week period, Egypt was terrorized absolutely positively, don't miss this, terrorized by the God of Israel as Moses came forward and those ten plagues, oh no, here comes another one. Each plague would last long enough for its effects to be felt before the next one would come along. I guess that's the way to produce the maximum impression upon the Egyptians of God's power and control. Now, I could preach a message on each one of the plagues. I will not, but you know them. One was turning the water into blood, the Nile River. Of course, that didn't last very long. They got over that. And then the next one was the frogs. The Nile would teem with frogs, and they would come up in your palace, in your bedroom. Can you imagine having frogs in your bedroom? You know, the houses of your officials. And then there were the lice that would take over, and the gnat, you don't call it gnats or lice. They would take over, and that was the next plague. And then there would be the flies, the pl plague of the flies. Some call this the plague of the wild animals. There would be the pestilence of livestock, that all the livestock outside of the nation of Israel would be struck dead. Then there were boils on skin. Then there was the thunderstorm of hail and fire. Then there were the locusts that, as a reference, all of these to the judgment we find in Revelation. And then to me, outside of the death of the firstborn, which is the reason they left, to me the, the most horrifying one would be for me was the fact darkness for three days. Let me just tell you, go a place where it doesn't get light at all for three days and have no way to light up. I'll tell you, that'll terrorize. And then the last of the ten plagues was the death of the firstborn. When we find about midnight, God went through. When if there wasn't the blood over the, the lintel of the doorpost, the Passover, every firstborn child would die. The wailing that would go through in Egypt. So finally, after the plague of the firstborn, all the Israelites were released. And they let him go. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. I don't have it on the screen, but I want you to look at Exodus chapter 12 real quickly before we walk through this. And this is kind of the climax. Hey, I came to you ten times. It took ten times. We won't get into the significance of that. There's a message there. And it says in Exodus 12, look at verse number 31. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night. That would be Pharaoh. And said, rise up and get you from among the people, both ye and your children of Israel, go and serve God as you've said. In other words, I've had enough. Get out. Leave. The mass exodus of God's people. To fulfill prophecy, they think, they think, imagine you put yourself in the slave's position, they think, they believe, it's just a short little track over to Canaan. You know, it's just a, as we say, it's a hop, skip, 
and a jump. We just go north. We go through uh, the part of what we call southern Israel. They call that today the Gaza Strip. We go right up north and there's Canaan. It's not that far away. It gets interesting. Though. It says in Exodus 12, 37, look down a couple verses, and the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. Now that's called, pronounced Sukkoth, but it, the way it's spelled in the Old English, but it's really Sukkot. And about, and about 600,000 on foot were, were men besides children. At this point, now ladies and gentlemen, I'm not, now look at me, I'm not demeaning their slavery. I'm not trying to minimize the heartache. I'm not trying to look beyond how they were slave labor for 400 years. But at this point, they didn't do anything. They just followed. God did all the plagues, correct? God, so they're just kind of following. So God was protecting them. God had a plan for them. God called Moses to lead them. And God was providing for them. In fact, we find in the text that they even got to take and pillage the, the Egyptians' you know, possessions as they headed out. I mean, God is really good. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, it's easy to trust God when all is going well. It is right now for them. I mean, think about it. Your God just struck the firstborn of the entire Egyptian nation. Your God had just had ten plagues, and you're sitting there going, God is good. It's easy to trust God when your bank balance is full, isn't it? It's easy to trust God when your health is well. The nation must be thinking to themselves, we have an awesome God. Look what He just did. But ladies and gentlemen, they're going to have to trust Him too because things are about to change. The first point I want to look at is when you trust God's leading, you realize there's no turning back. You're not going back. Now, you know the story. If you've been in the Bible, you know several times they would wish they were back as slaves in Egypt rather than having to go through what they're going through. But when you trust God, there's no turning back. Now, look at Exodus 13, 17, and I want to go through a couple verses that mean a lot here. And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, God led them. Now remember, who's leading them? God. Now you find the word God led them. We find that in verse number 17. We find it in verse number 18. We find it in verse number 21. And we also find in Exodus chapter 14 a reference there. In, chapter, in verse number 2, he uses the word turn. Now, I know you probably can't read the text. I probably should have put it on multiple screens. That's a small font. Uh, I mean, to me, it looks like, you know, the very bottom line when you get an eye test, right? But anyway, God led them. And it says there in verse number 7, God led them. Now, here's the key. Not through the way of the land of the Philistines. The shortest route. Now, there are many people to discuss why this, but they, they must have believed. The shortest distance between two points is what? Everybody look here. What is it? A straight line. But where God led them, now don't miss this, is, uh, excuse me, we're going south. You ever been that way? I remember one time in college, I had a friend of mine, they like, how many of you like to talk in a car? And you just get talking, you know, you're going on a trip, you talk, 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 talk. Well, there was an individual, I don't, I think it was one of my wife's friends, I can't care, sure, she's probably watching now, so she'll correct me afterwards, but they were talking, and we were supposed to meet up in Orlando, Florida. You guys know where Orlando is, right? It's the central part of the state. They were talking so much, by the time they realized that they were already in Fort Lauderdale. That's a long way. It's like three hours. I, I go, I don't understand that. Now, I, don't, I know it wasn't Ann, because Ann wouldn't, She's just not that personality to allow that to go on. But, you know, the talking goes on. Here's what's happening. They should have gone at least over look what we call north. They do call it north, kind of northwest. And I'm going to have a map here in a minute. In fact, I'll show it right now. I don't have a, do I have a highlight? I don't have, yeah. Okay, here they are here in Ramsey's. That's where they're being let go. Now, by the way, there's several different routes that may have occurred. 
If God didn't put a period at the end of the sentence, don't put it there, okay? This is one of the potential roots. Oh, that's the other one. But right here, they need to go over here, right? I need to go right there. That's Canaan somewhere in that area, okay? A little actually so far north because there's the Dead Sea. Uh, it's up where that light is, okay? But uh, that's where Canaan is. But look where God led them. He told them to go to Sukkoth, Sukkoth, rather. I want you to go over here, and this is the crossing here. This is an extension. Well, they believe the Red Sea uh, was extended at that period of time. This is the crossing. Others believe it crossed here. You know, it doesn't really matter. They crossed the sea, okay? But here's the point. They didn't go that way. There's no turning back. And they must have said, God, I know you just did all these plagues, but you got the directions wrong. That's not where we're supposed to go. So it says there, the next, next one I'll show you the other anticipated route. This one actually gives a little, this is so, the pixelation is terrible. I should have done a better job. They go south, and this is somewhere around where they had at least until the next point. We'll talk about, then they head back north again. So here's the point. God led them, it says in verse number 17, it says, God led them, not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest preadventure the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. In other words, the text comes across as saying, God was, didn't lead them that direction because maybe they would have seen some of the enemies of God, some of the enemies there, and got frightened and gone back. One way to look at that. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness. Are you kidding me? You're leading me here? By the way, this is the 40 years of wandering here. Boy, that's wandering, isn't it? And they didn't cross into Canaan up here until Joshua was done. But here's the point. There's no turning back. You're not going to go back because, if you can see my little dot, right there is certain death. Hey, we're in this thing. And when you get gloriously saved, you don't just put your foot in the water, you get knee deep in it and you plow forward in spite of what may come your way. And there's way too many people that want to look back to Egypt. And God help you for doing that. We see that God led the people. And it says in verse number 8, that God led the people through the wilderness of the Red Sea. Now the word Red Sea comes from the the, the Hebrew word, sea of reeds. Sea of reeds. Now, that's an interesting way to, to look at that because that will help you define because this was marshland. This, this is not. So typically, you have to believe the crossing was somewhere here rather than way down here. And this was an extension of the Red Sea. Now, I don't want to fight over that. I'm not sure it's really arguing over, but it means the sea of reeds. So we see this. It says that they went there. Now, the whole point of this, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look down at verse number 20. Verse number 20. And they took their journey from Sukkot, which is Sukkoth, the way it's, looked, it's pronounced there, or worded there, and encamped in Ethium, in the edge of the wilderness. So they decide, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to go down here. See, Sukkoth, that is where the ruins of it are, somewhere around. So they went south. They didn't go over here. They even went further south later. So it says that's where they went. And the Lord went before them. Now don't miss this. Look at verse 21, please. The Lord went before them. By day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them in the way. Now everybody look here. Don't miss this. This is the message. Who's directing them? Answer me. Now, that's not important now because they don't really care. Eh, it's a little bit longer. We'll take this scenic route. But they're going to care in a few minutes because they're going to get knee-deep in some anxiety. But uh, we understand that God is leading by a pillar of cloud. It says there, He leads them, excuse me, by a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by now a pillar of fire. God's doing it. 
And it says in verse 22, He took not away the cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So they're following God's lead. This is a one-way trip. You're not coming back. I told my kids when they went off to college, we spent 18 years raising them. We did what we felt the Lord would have us to do. But when you do come back to visit, and yes, they will, it's not going to be the same. By the way, you have to kind of say that. And many times, ladies and gentlemen, we don't, we don't like where God has put us. Now, don't miss this. Everybody look here. So we want to go back to the way it was. Can I tell you, it's not going to be the same when you get there. There's one thing I have heard over and over again about the pandemic. I can't wait till it gets back to the way it was. It will never get back to the way it was. I think it'll be better, especially for Christians, because I believe it's really folk having us focus on what is truth and what is real. But things have changed. So we see that. Number two, sometimes we have to trust God and we need to follow him when the route is not understood. And that kind of is similar to my first point. Look at chapter 14. It gets even more interesting. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they what? Say it. What's the word there? Turn. Change direction. Now, you might think, and of course this was done on purpose, that God's changed his mind. Turn. Turn means to, I mean, typically, this is 180 you know, this is 145 degrees. I mean, this is 360. You turn, that's all the way around. So you had to turn. You had to change, change direction. So God told us to turn and encamp before Pahiroth, between Migdal and the sea. Now, he's saying, I want you to turn. Now, don't miss this. Now, the geography really helps you understand this because a casual reading of that you know, you're not really sure where the different places are, but what we find is, is that they turn, they're heading this way, this way. And they turn and go that way. Now, does that kind of would look like you don't know what you're doing, right? I'm going this way, and then I'm going that way. And see, that what was done, all to, con to not to confuse the nation of Israel, so the Egyptian would say, they don't know what they're doing, they're lost, let's go get them. So it says there, and they went, and it gets better, between Migdal and the sea against Baal-Zephron. Now Baal-Zephron is right against the northern part of the sea. And Baal-Zephron is where the crossing of the Red Sea takes place. Because it's there, don't miss this, they're stuck. Now, look at the text with me, please. It's not me speaking, I'm just giving you what the God's Word says. It says very clearly that God led them to Baal Zephyr. And it says you shall camp by the sea. Now, let me just say this. When you're camping by the sea, there's one way you can't go because there's water. By the way, a geography lesson of this area, there's a mountain on one side, you can't go that way, and the south, you just came, and they're coming from that direction. So you're stuck. You could say you're in a rock and a hard place, but guess who, let, guess who put them there? Here, hold on. God. Now, at this point, at this point, don't miss this. Don't miss this. They didn't know somebody was coming after them. So they're okay. We're just going to camp by the reeds. And then something takes place. Look at 14.3, please. For the Pharaoh will save the children of Israel. They are entangled in the land, and the wilderness have shut them in. 
So Pharaoh's going to get this idea, you know, I've got some scouts out there, and they say they went this way, now they're going that way. Let me show you a map of this, it's better. They started here, and there's where they wound up camping. Now, does that look like somebody knows what they're doing? No, it doesn't, does it? And that's what's happened. And ladies and gentlemen, here's the application for all of us. Sometimes God leads you one direction, and you go another direction, and almost looks like, don't miss this, God has no idea what he's doing. And we'll help God out, because guess what we'll do? We'll just go back, we'll go back home and be slaves. You know what they says? It says in verse number 3 that they'll look confused, they'll look lost. This will surely bring the Egyptians on us. they got to be thinking that. We've been told by the camp, by the Sea of Reeds. We're trapped. What if the Egyptians come? We don't think they're coming yet. We don't know they're coming. God, I don't understand why you led us here. The shortest route wasn't taken. We started going one direction, and then we went another. There's no way out. To escape, if he comes, will be impossible. Let me say this. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they're entangled to the land and the wilderness has shut them in. Well, that's exactly what happened. And the route that you're in may not be understood either. However, God is leading. I can't tell you the number of times my dear sweet wife and I have prayed and said, God, why is it I'm here? And I'm not talking about a physical location. Why is it we're dealing with this? Why is it that other people don't deal with this, but we do? Why is it I headed south, now I'm going north? There's got to be a reason. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole issue is this. Sometimes we've got to follow God when the route is not understood. I think of that in my own life. By the way, God puts you where you are for a reason. He puts you in a family and a mom and dad for a reason. He puts you in an income bracket for a reason. He put you with certain siblings that God gave you for a reason. A mom and dad for a reason. God led you for a reason. This didn't make any sense to them at all. And then we come to what we call God's timing. Now, it gets really scary here. If this was a movie... This is the part where you tell your kids to get scared, go to your room. You have kids like that? My kids, my, my, my daughter always got scared watching The Wizard of Oz. Every time that witch would have her broom burning, she goes, come here, my child. And she would always, and still to this day, I say that, Trisha will run and hide. She's got six kids. Come here, my child. She said, we don't watch that kind of stuff. Well, I'm sorry, we did. Okay. But anyway, you trust in God's timing. Now look what it says in verse number 4. God had a reason. There's no coincidences with God. Look at verse 4. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Don't miss this. And he shall follow after them. And what's it? And who? I, God, will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. There was a purpose for them looking confused. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt, the people fled, and the heart of the Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot, took his people with him, and six hundred chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. In other words, now let me just say this. I want you to do this just for a moment. 
You're an Egyptian, right? You've been through ten plagues. And I'm so glad those people are gone. I got a child that died. We've had blood in the Nile River. We've had lice. Our cattle are dead. It was dark. We've had frogs. We've had all this. And you want me to go chase them down? Are you kidding me? Think, think what they dealt with. But they followed Pharaoh. God's timing is exactly what was needed for God to be glorified. God put the nation of Israel into a position that it had to be God that got them out. Because just like me and just like you, after a while, we'll forget what God does and we'll start acting like it was all about us. The greatest miracle in all the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, is right here. It's repeated more than any other Old Testament story. Right here, the crossing of the Red Sea. That only could have happened, that only could have happened if Israel would have been stuck. God's timing was perfect. Perfect. Now, They had to remember God led him there. And by the way, God's timing is perfect. Did you know you're here right now in 2020 sitting in this church because this is where God's timing has you to be? I love people say, I wish I lived back in the Victorian age. It was so great back then. Nonsense. They didn't have antibiotics. You died. Average male lived to be 49 years old. It was awful. Christianity was not the glorified thing you thought it was. It was really pretty bad in most places, especially the Anglicans. So stop glorifying the past. You live here right now and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and be a blessing to some young people. And I'm speaking to people my age that are always worried about how great it used to be 20 years ago. And by the way, it was never that good. You're here now. The timing is perfect. And God led them there. God put them there for such a time as this as we find in Esther. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God knows everything. And ladies and gentlemen, this is our problem. I'm just like you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes, There's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you shall be able to bear it. Let God lead you out of it. Now, I want you to look, as we close here, I want you to look at verse number, uh, verse number 9. This is a heart-wrenching realization. You ever gotten an email or phone call and you go, oh no. Not good. It's all full. Verse number nine, they came to the realization they're all going to die. They just, we're in a suicide pact. There's 600,000 of us there. We're all going to, our kids, we've caught everybody out here. We're all dead. We're dead. We're dead. We're dead. We're dead. That's what verse number nine says. But you know God got him out of there, right? I mean, most of us know the end of the story. That's the problem with some people when they read the Bible. We know so much of it casually. When we read it through, we don't get the impact God wants for us. Look at verse number 9. This is horrifying to the people of Israel. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and... Uh, overtook them. You know, I imagine this. There's a cloud of dust coming. Here's the, the cloud and the pillar of fire. You led us here so we could be slaughtered by them. You have to trust in God's timing. It makes no but God had a plan, and God had a purpose. So we see here, you can't turn back. 
When you trust God's leading, you can't turn back. You might not understand why. But let me tell you this, and I'm done. You can sure trust His timing. As I close with this, everybody look here, quickly, and I'm done. Whatever you're going through, God is using this so He will be glorified. You have to trust the sovereignty and His grace in His time. That's a hard thing to do when you see the cloud of dust coming. Here comes the chariots. Their necks are just, the, the blood is boiling. They're, you see the veins speaking out of their, their, their necks. They're ready to take you out. And you look back and say, God, why in the world are we here? So he will be glorified when you get out of it. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for this invitation. Lord, you'd use it. We're not going to ask that you come forward but we would like you to pray in your seat. For some, you need to pray that Jesus Christ would save you from your sins for such a time as this. Asking Christ to come into your life by asking Christ, say, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Your sovereignty and your grace has called me here today. And Lord, I know that there's nothing I can do, but I throw 100% of my life and plead with you to save my soul. Maybe that's the prayer you need today. For others, we're going through dire circumstances and it's, it's pretty bleak. But we know God has put us here. We trust His timing. Let's all stand. Can we stand together, please? Let's stand.